Right, so uh, this morning I am going to read from Matthew, Matthew 6, 25 to um, 34. And um, this is from the, uh, it's a new international version. Um, and the title is Jesus Teaches About Worry. Um, luckily, I wasn't worried about <laughs> standing up. And uh, Russ says to me every time, I don't know how you do that, but I suppose being a teacher, you just do it. So, Okay. Therefore, I tell you not to worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? and the body more important than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the fields grow. They do not labour or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in his splendour was dressed like one of those. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into the air, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and the righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We were saying beforehand that um, glad Norman's preaching this morning <laughs> on worry. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's pray for you. Lord, we laugh about this, but actually it's serious. And uh, Lord, I pray that you will anoint Norman this morning to bring the words that you have uh, given to him to us, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, set people free from worry this morning through Norman's ministry. So, Father, please, just be with him now. Fill him with your Holy Spirit, I pray. And uh, just speak through his mouth, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Everyone's worried. They're all looking at a bit pensive. But one of the things I noticed this morning, because I don't come here every week. Oh, got a clicker. Praise God. That was something I was worried about. Um... <laughs> Norman, can you hold the mic? Oh, sorry. How's that? Excellent. Right. That might be a blessing, but there we go. <laughs> I'm not here every week. I haven't been here every week, but I haven't been here for a few weeks. But I came here this morning, and I sat in here, and I took part in the worship, and I, all I could think of was, you've been praying, haven't you? You've had a day of prayer. And because you had a day of prayer yesterday, I believe it made a difference this morning. And because you're so close to it and we're all part of it, you might have noticed it. But because I haven't been here for a few weeks, I walked in and I went, oh, Jesus is here. I can feel the presence of God. Somebody's been praying. Praise God for that. But our subject this morning, worry. Now, this is Nick's fault. Nick gave me the best part of two months notice to that I would be speaking about worry. And so, of course, the inevitable happened that that simply meant there was more time for me to be tested and to see how I shape up on the subject of worry. Because the moment I said, okay, I'll preach on worry, things started to go wrong, <laughs> mainly at work 
and things weren't going so great and there was problem after problem after problem, issue after issue after issue. But do you know what? God was equal to them all. And none of them turned into anything nasty. Mark Twain, he said, I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which have never happened. And that's my testimony over the last few months. Next time though, Nick, let's notice. All right, but <laughs> there you go, I had that. Now the passage that was just read to us starts with the word therefore. So you know the saying about therefore, do you? Whenever there's a therefore, we need to look what it's there for. So we have to go back. And basically, if you go back a few verses, you find Jesus basically teaching on materialism. And who or what is the master of your life? God or money? That's the way Jesus put it. It can't be both. You can serve one, you can serve the other, but it can't be one. And it comes with a promise. He said, if you choose God and choose to serve God, then don't worry, he will look after everything else. And that's a promise. That's good, isn't it? Okay, praise God. You still look worried. Okay, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert here, actually. I'm going to cut, just in case we don't get right through this, I'm going to give you the end now. <laughs> okay. This is what I discovered looking about this subject about worry. The key to this whole subject, to the key to the whole thing of worry and where we're going to end up, it's all about our relationship with God. That's what it boils down to, this whole thing. So hopefully um, this morning what we're going to do is we're going to have a, a look at what we worry about. We're going to have a quick look at what a horrible thing worry really is. We're going to look at the antidote to worry. That's the good bit. And then we're going to get back to what I just said, the key to living as free from worry as possible. Now, we all get worried. Does anybody like to put their hand up and say they don't worry? No, you're all being honest. Great. We've all got stories we could tell about worry. I know I have. And it's often just an issue of scale. You know, what you're worried about, how much, and what about. Um, Jesus talked about worry in the context of the basics. Food, clothing, and a big emphasis on don't worry about tomorrow. One day at a time. That's what Jesus was uh, talking about. Now, let me try this, because what I did is I, I thought, well, if that's what Jesus taught about, what are we worrying about today? What's high on the agenda? So I did some research and thought, what is the major thing? And I boiled it down to about nine things. And in no particular order, they're these. Well, that doesn't work. Let's try that. Let's turn it on. There we go. Oh, it buzzed. Okay. Oh, hey, money. Everyone marries about money at some stage of life. Work is right up there. Worry about work issues. That's a biggie. Relationships, especially when you're young. You know, does she really love me? <laughs> okay. He looked at me. Okay, relationships, that's a big thing to worry about. Health, that might be your own health or the health of somebody else close to you, a loved one. I know in our family at the moment we've got some elderly relatives and we're kind of concerned for them as they, as they get older. Okay, so punctuality, that is a major thing to worry, it turns out. you just got to catch a bus or a train or an aeroplane or get to work on time. People really worry about that one. Where do we go now? Getting old. <laughs> Didn't see it, I must be getting old. Okay, people are concerned about that, quite naturally. Um, crime. Okay, we, we, we yesterday had, we were the victims of crime, weren't we? We've sold eggs on a far front garden for, for a couple of years now. Somebody came along and stole the lot. <laughs> and the pot of money, the, you know, to give to it. And it just unsettled us. Do you know what I mean? The thought that somebody would do that. So it was a concern. Our appearance. 
No? All right. Okay. Um, people do worry about their appearance and what they look like and what they're going to wear and what have you. It's a natural thing. Parenting is a major thing as well we worry about. Anybody got children? Yeah, I got three in the 20s. <laughs> Yeah, right. Okay. By the grace of God, he's looking after them. Now I, now, I got that lot from doing some research on the internet. There were three, I thought about it, and there were three things that I thought were missing that I might have expected to be there. And they all begin with E, so you can remember them. One was the environment. Everyone, the press, everybody bangs on the environment, but it never appeared on any of these lists. I don't know why. I'm not saying any comment about it. It just wasn't there. Perhaps other people got more things they worry about more than that. The other thing that I expected to be there that wasn't was education. All the exam results have just come in, haven't they, in recent weeks. And some people don't know if they've got a school to go back to because it might fall. Is your school okay? Yeah, we're fine. Well, you're fine. It's not going to collapse. That's great. That's good. Nothing to worry about. Now, I generally am not a big worrier. I don't do a lot of worrying. But a few years ago, I had to take an exam. And I turned to jelly the night before. I, I've never worried so much. Angela's smiling because she was there. She witnessed it. This strong, confident guy just turned into a, a, a mess of blubber on the floor the night before exam. So education is something I would have thought was there. Maybe it's further down the list. But the big one that I expected to be there and they didn't want to talk about was eternity. God has put eternity in the heart of man. And if everyone is honest, what happens next? Can we know? Where are we going? Are we living in a vague hope? Or is there more security and there's more we can discover about that? So that's worry. I don't want to really get into worry too much. I mean, our, our personal family worry and concern is leaving the house, getting a mile down the road. Somebody turn the iron off. <laughs> Who took this iron on? Have you ever done that? Shall we turn back and check? Let's ring the neighbours, get them to come round. So that's our one. I mean, I don't even use the iron. <laughs> you can probably tell. But I mean, we've got daughters who do. And our daughters, that's something to worry about, not the ironing. But that's just how we could do it. And we could spend the next 30 minutes talking about worry and all the things there are to worry about. But that would only worry you make matters worse. Now I listened to somebody preach on the subject of worry for an hour and after an hour of listening to this guy, good preacher, talking about worry, at the end of it I felt thoroughly depressed. <laughs> I felt thoroughly beaten up and I'm certain that wasn't his intention and it's not my intention this morning to leave you in that way. So we all know that telling someone don't worry, or worry is evil, or worry is wrong, or worry is a sin. That's just going to add to their anxiety by going down that route. So I've therefore, I've changed the title from worry to don't worry. Okay, that's better, isn't it? Is it have we got any grammar experts here? Anyone good at grammar? Yes. Is that a double negative? It's just something I looked at. I'm not, I'm not a grammar expert. I thought, does that, it's not. I thought it kind of turned it into a positive. But never mind. I just was curious. So we're going to take just a few minutes to look at the subject of worry and why it's such a big issue before we look at the antidote. God does not promise us freedom from things to worry about. He says, don't worry. He doesn't say there won't be things you can worry about. And of course, there's going to be all sorts of different levels of things to worry about. Some people have got a lot more to worry about than others, and that's clear. And we just need to be aware of that, you know, before we say, don't worry. Oh, really? That's your issue. OK, maybe worry a little bit, you know. So we've just got to be sensitive. But one of the things I noticed when reading this passage through a few times, notice how gentle 
Jesus was. He spoke in reassuring terms. He wasn't hitting us over the head when he said, don't worry. It was Jesus. It really was gentle Jesus. He wasn't beat his, beating us up. And he used examples from nature that we read to illustrate the Father's care. But as always, he's looking first and foremost at the relationship. He wants us to know him and to trust him. The focus is all on Father. So are you looking at the problem or are you looking at the person? Are you looking at the issue or are you looking at the solution? Now, I just add a note of caution here. We need to be able to discern the difference between worry and warning. Sometimes God will tell us something we need to take notice of. There's something we need to get an issue. An example came to my mind is some years ago, just before we went on a family holiday, a trusted church leader who I respect said, I've got a word for you, Norman, from God. I went, oh, excellent. And it went like this. The enemy, Norman, is going to make an attempt on your life and try and kill you and your family. That was his warning. And then he said, don't worry. <laughs> You'll see it coming. Now that didn't thrill me with delight. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, I, I actually got very angry. And I said, how dare you say something like that and leave it there? What on earth are you talking about? He said, I don't know, that's all I've got. But don't worry. You'll see it coming. And I won't go into the full story, there isn't time, but I will say this, as it panned out, the enemy did make an attempt on our life and we did see it coming right at the last minute. And when we saw it coming and realized what had happened, we had a praise party. And I had to go back to that person when I go back from my holiday and humbly apologize and just say, sorry I got angry with you, but thanks for the warning, you got it right. So it did cause some anxiety, I'll be honest, but I saw it coming. So um, don't worry does not mean don't be concerned. And it doesn't mean don't make plans. If you've got something you need to plan or work out, do it. Okay, let's have a look at all, look at worry itself. This is the way we're gonna do it. Worry is a thief, it's a thief. So we're gonna look at worry in these terms. Worry divides the mind, it invades the mind, it divides the mind. So what does worry steal? The first thing it steals is our faith. Worry is the opposite of faith. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Worry will rob us of all of that. Faith is our active belief in God, the security of our relationship through Jesus Christ. In the passage we read, Jesus was teaching of worry, and then he said, oh ye of little faith. So we need to get some perspective on this. I love this saying from a guy I think wasn't even a Christian. But he said, sorrow looks back, worry looks around, faith looks up. So if we worry, it's robbing us of our faith. It's robbing us of our time. It's a waste of time we tend to spend too much time borrowing from tomorrow or oh, what's going to happen tomorrow what's going to happen the next day um worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow it drains today of its strength what a brilliant quote that's from corrie ten boon do you know corrie ten boon yeah. i should imagine you do if you don't know corrie ten boon look her up okay because um that's what she said. And when you consider where she came from and her circumstances, it's quite something. Let's play a little game. Excuse me. I've just taken a sip out of that. Would anybody like to tell me how much they think this glass of water weighs? How much do you think that might weigh? 
400, that's a brilliant guess from somebody technical. A anybody else? Sorry, 600. What about now? <laughs> Any other guess? 600, 400? 200. 200. I'd have to drink about half of that, I think. But I, I, I'd say at the most about 500. But the real answer is this. That probably weighs, if I look, it's shaking a bit. No, I'm holding it. Hang on, let's hold it straight. If I let you guess away for the next five minutes, I can tell you one thing. In five minutes' time, that's going to weigh an awful lot more in my hand than it does right now. And if I leave that half an hour, and if I spend the whole time speaking to you while I'm holding this glass of water, in half an hour, that's going to be down there. So the weight of it is really dependent on how long I'm holding it for. And the weight of the worry that you're worrying about can be hugely dependent on about the amount of time you hold on to it. So let's get rid of it. And then it won't do so much. We have a very long garden. I'm going to put that down. Getting heavy. And uh, it's somehow fallen to me to carry bags of chicken feed from one end of the garden to the other. I think they're about 15 kilograms, between 15 and 20 kilograms, something like that. But I know that that bag of kilogram feels an awful lot heavier at the bottom of the garden than it did at the top, because it's quite a walk. And, and, I, and I thought, I'll throw it on my shoulder. I did my shoulder. So don't hold on to the worry because it's going to increasingly weigh more. Worry is a thief of our focus. It leads to distraction. It's a waste of headspace. It takes our eyes off Jesus. What we just said, I'll say that quote again. Sorrow looks back. Worry looks around. Faith looks up. Faith has got to focus. Read you a bit of Hebrews. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. But if we're worrying, it takes away our focus. So we need to focus on Jesus, his call, his purpose, his assignment for us. How many of you get assignments from Jesus? I'm going to do this for Jesus. It might take a day or a couple of weeks, but we need to focus on what it is and not be distracted. Let's rattle through these. It's a, a thief of our function. We're called to be salt and light. We're called to make disciples. We're called to be a witness. And inactivity leads to paral it paralyzes us. I've got me words. I tried to say that word, it wouldn't come out. If I'm holding this glass of water, which is getting heavier, all the time I'm holding it, my hand isn't doing anything else. It can do no other activity because I'm holding on to the glass of water or I'm holding on to worry. And likewise, my mind can't apply itself to anything else if it's full of worry. It preoccupies it. So we need to offload it. It's horrible, isn't it? Worry. Let's look at another one. We'll get through these now. Value. Worry robs us of our value before God. It leads us to doubt our value to God. When it comes to the character of God, the golden phrase in the passage that was just read is, will he not much more? Or how much more would he clothe you? How much more would he feed you? Because you're more valuable than the birds. You're more valuable than the grass and the plants. So worry will devalue us in our eyes. It's horrible, isn't it? We'll get through these. Joy. Worry just sucks the peace and joy out of life. Has anybody sort of seen worry and sense of humour in the same sentence? It just doesn't go, does it? Um, so let's get through a few of these. Peace. Now we're told that we're in a mental health epidemic right now. 
Have you noticed when you listen to the news or anybody talk about anything, or oh, hang on, I've just got to shoehorn my mental health into this sentence somewhere. It's everywhere. Have you noticed that? Everything says, well, we'll do this, we'll do this, but how does it affect my mental health? It's absolutely the topic of the day. Nothing seems to get mentioned unless that is put into it. Now, to be honest, I'm not surprised <coughs> that mental health is such a problem. Or when, when I say mental health, I'm, I'm talking about the loss of peace in our hearts and in our minds. Because there can be no lasting peace outside of a relationship with Father God. So if you haven't got that relationship, it's not surprising if your peace is struggled. I don't know if any of you watch films. One of my favourites of recent times is a movie called A Bridge of Spies. Has anybody seen that? About a, a, a Russian spy in the height of the Cold War. He's caught by the Americans, put on trial, faces the death sentence. He's appointed a rather reluctant lawyer to defend him, and they get to know each other. And the lawyer almost becomes impressed by this spy. And he says to him on several occasions, you could face the death penalty. What we're trying to fight for is your life. And gave him all the issues. And he says to him, aren't you worried about this? And the spy just turns back and quietly says, would it help? brilliant line and it comes over time and time again health we're nearly through these health can be obviously one of the main things we worry about and annoyingly the more we worry about things the more that can affect our health uh, worry can do all sorts of damaging things to our insides. It's a downward spiral. Now, I read that 84% of people admit to losing sleep through worry. I would suggest that the other 16% are fibbing. <laughs> right? They just don't admit it. 84 admit it. The other 16 don't admit it. Last one. Our identity. When we worry, as Christians, we forget who we are. We're sons of the living God. Now, when Jesus is giving this teaching, a distinction is made between the pagans and those seeking the kingdom of God. He calls some, some versions say pagans, some say Gentiles. Well, we are Gentiles. But what we're going to say is that those who are seeking God and those who aren't, and he says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. So he's talking to those who know the father. He's talking to those who are sons and daughters and have got an identity with the father. And when we worry, we're losing our identity in God. Horrible, isn't it? absolutely horrible let's get to the good news the antidote to worry and this is the good bit we're getting getting to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness now it really struck me when i was doing this that's one of the most famous passages in the bible that's one of the most well-known encouragements Seek first the kingdom of God. Excuse me. But then you have to remind yourself the exact context in which Jesus spoke those words. Worry. So we need to um, really have a look at it in its context. So as opposed to our self-rule and our self-righteousness, we're chasing his rule, his way, his order. It's much better to spend our time looking at the kingdom, the antidote to worry. This passage about worry gets, gets that punchline. Seek first the kingdom of God. So what does it mean? What does it look like to seek the kingdom and his righteousness? So we'll just have a few minutes looking at that. We'll just do it in order. It's easy. Seek. You seek. It's not for the passive. It requires effort. 
It requires energy. It requires action on our part. Not works. It's not works for salvation, but it does require effort. It's a verb. It's a doing thing. It's one of my favourite verses in the Bible is in Ephesians 5. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children as light. And then it says, and find out what pleases the Lord. I love that verse. Find out what pleases the Lord. You do it. Go and spend time with Father. What pleases you, Father? What do you like? Love it. Two ways we can do that. One is through reading our Bible. Another one is through prayer. And this links directly back to the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. Give us today our daily bread. Okay, I'm going to rattle on. I'll try to. There we go. First, it's our number one priority. Now, this isn't really a problem when we come to discover what the kingdom is all about. The more you see, the more you understand of the kingdom, the better it gets. Two parables that Jesus gave quickly, again in Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, in other words, he was looking, he was seeking, he hid it again, and then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. So it was a priority for him, because he understood it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. He's looking, he's seeking. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, his kingdom, we could speak for hours for this, don't worry, I'm not going to. Um, just conscious of the time. I say this, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. All those things are incompatible with the word worry. Often our worries, our struggles, our frustrations, they just lie in a decision to opt out of his kingdom, to opt out of his rule. Do things our way. Seek in some other kingdom where the yoke turns out to be not quite so easy and his burden not quite so light. And fortunately, we have to learn the lessons the hard way. There's a lot we could say about his kingdom, but I want to press on. His righteousness as opposed to our own. If anyone's sitting here this morning with a religious mindset that says, if I'm a good boy, if I'm a good girl, if I show how righteous I am, how good I am, then maybe I can get closer to God. Maybe he'll look kindly on me. That's not how it works in the Christian. That's not how it works in the kingdom. To Kruvian says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now I'm just going to read that again, and this time I'm going to put the verse in that comes before it. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin. If anybody here this morning, you don't know God and you're not in that place where you're being reconciled to God, where you know you've got that relationship right, we implore you this morning, be reconciled to God. And if that's you, please, I implore you, don't leave this building this morning before chatting it through with somebody and saying, I need to be right with God. Okay, lastly, nearly, comes with a promise. And all these things will be given to you as well. Now, at this point, some of you might be thinking to yourself, this has turned into a bit of a Sunday school, hasn't it? <laughs> this is some of the imagery, some of the pictures are a little bit childlike. Had anybody noticed that? You know, I might do in Sunday school. Well, that's what be the reason is, because as I said at the beginning, the whole thing is very relational and childlike. Notice I said childlike, not childish. They're two different things. And I had to sort of really think about this. 
If you're childish, you're immature, you're irresponsible in your behavior, your attitude, you're, you're lacking something, expected development in your emotions um, or intelligence to be an adult, that's childish. An example, I think, if, you, if anybody knows their Dickens, there's a character in Bleak House called Harold Skimpole. I loved him. And he had this phrase, I am but a child. And he would take no responsibility for anything. And he borrowed money, never paid it back. And any time anybody challenged him to grow up or be a man, he says, ah, but I am but a child. Okay. I tried that with my wife once, saying that. <laughs> Didn't work. Being childlike is something different. It's more endearing, it's innocent. There's curiosity, there's trust, there's wonder. That's to be childlike. And Jesus said this, let me just read it to you. He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, notice like little children, not childish, but like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. The key to this all, folks, is our relationship with our Father and King. If you're struggling with worry, get closer to God. Don't worry about anything. Cry unto Father, cry unto the King, get in the kingdom, and, and talk to him about everything. And that's the message of this worry issue to me. And don't worry if you're a little bit childlike. Amen. I'm going to finish there because I've rattled on. Bless you. Thanks, Norman. Okay, let's just uh, pray for a moment. And um, Holy Spirit, we invite you now. We've heard what uh, Norman has got to say to us this morning about worry. And Holy Spirit, I just pray now that if there are any here who are feeling burdened and overwhelmed by worry, in the name of Jesus, we say to that uh, spirit of worry, be gone. Be gone, because we are children of God. We are holy people. We are a new creation in Christ. And the old way of our life may have been full of worry, but now we claim that promise that you will set us free. So please, Lord, would you just do some releasing now today of any person here who is bound by worry, for whom it is just a, a debilitating um, facet of their life. Would you bring freedom and release and help them to take on board what they've heard this morning from Norman, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like prayer after the service this morning for what we've been talking about, then see either myself or Norman and we'll pray with you. Helen's going to lead us in a last song.